Hi everyone, glad to see us on your channel. Today we will listen to the third part of the memoirs of Francois de Joffre, one of the French pilots who fought on the Soviet-German front as part of the Volunteer Aviation Regiment, Normandy, Neiman, from May 1944 to the day of the surrender of Nazi Germany. On May 25, 1944, the Normandy Regiment was withdrawn. Squadrons Ruin, Le Havre, Cherbourg, and can one after another, in links, take to the air. The regiment is accompanied by General Zakharov on his La Five. The direction is to the west. The first landing is scheduled for Borovskoy, south of Smolensk. Borovskoy, a former Russian airbase, blown up and burned by the Germans during the retreat, was an intermediate point for us. Here we did not linger and immediately flew to Dubrovka. Never before had I felt such a thirst for battle. For too long I had led an idle life. I felt a rush of new strength and energy, and a vague desire for revenge. I was in a hurry to compete with these young men from the Luftwaffe, and felt the need to suppress in myself a few of their own victories bitter memories of a major general defeat in June 1940. Below us is a solid plain. The forests have been replaced by fields. Bomb craters, ashes in the place of villages speak of war. We fly over the Dnieper, and leaving behind us the heavily destroyed Smolensk, continue our flight towards Dubrovka. The light transparent air is streaked with sunlight. In front of me is Lefebvre's airplane, shining like a polished pan of an exemplary hostess. I hear his voice on the radio. Hello, De Joffre. Attention. We're entering the combat zone. Don't forget your guns and your sights. Turn on the compressor just in case. If we meet father and son, maybe it'll warm you up a little in the first battle. It was like he read my mind. I was just thinking about my future first fight. And when Lefebvre reminded me of father and son, I couldn't contain a slight joyful excitement. Whether it is true or not, but they told me that in the area of Smolensk, almost constantly circling in the clouds, a pair of fighters, Fock Wolf 190. One of them pilots the father, the other, the son. Very nimble and very dangerous adversaries, they attack unexpectedly and prey on everything from sanitized potus and damaged planes returning to base to individual automobiles on the roads. But today we land without any adventures near the small village of Dubrovka, 15 kilometers from the front line. In Dubrovka, we are housed in huts. We sleep on wooden beds, having somehow adapted our sleeping bags. The canteen is quite good, and for us it plays an important role. It is also in a hut, similar to all Belarusian huts, and inside its walls are decorated with touching welcoming inscriptions. Welcome, Normandy. Glory to the brave French pilots, who together with the Red Army smashed the damned enemy. But not only greetings awaited us. Bedbugs are also plentiful. They attack ferociously at night, and it is against them that we start our first battles and come out victorious. The lamps at the headboard are one of the innovations that immediately caught our eye. They are made of 37mm shell casings. A homemade wick floats in a brass cup filled with kerosene. The lamps are somewhat primitive, but they are quite cleverly made. Even those of us who had been stunned by the Neum storefronts of Cairo now looked at these humble lamps with admiration. Immediately after arriving in Dubrovka, we are gathered by Lefebvre. He gives instructions and some advice on the upcoming fights. So, we'll act in pairs. All keep at the same altitude. The distance between the planes. 50 meters. Each plane follows the tail of its leader. Speed, 480. Weapons at the ready. Tanks to be switched after 30 minutes of flight. Do everything possible to keep your eyes on your lead. Land only on the alternate runway. Now, gentlemen, go to sleep. Don't forget the alarm. Good night. See you tomorrow. Easter, May 28, 1944. The weather seems to be settling in. A light northwest wind is blowing. The 3rd Squadron is in good shape. Eight fighters with regimental commander, Poyed, makes the first familiarization flight. Together with Lefebvre, my squadron commander, I rush to the fortifications of Vitebsk, which is still in the hands of the Germans. 
At the same height to the right and left of us fly three other lynx, carefully watching every corner of the sky. Caution! Above all, every dense cloud we penetrate with our machines may be hiding the enemy. Tighten up, to Joffre. Tighten up and turn to the left. Lefebvre commands me over the radio. We're heading south and flying exactly along the front line. Nothing suspicious in the sky. On the ground, everything seems calm. Enemy air defenses are silent. True, we're flying at an altitude of 4,000 meters. All in all, everything is going well, even, in my opinion, too well. We have been in flight for more than 30 minutes, but at least we have some prey in our teeth. There. Finally, I hear crackling in my headphones. There is a slight cough, and Lefebvre's calm voice. Follow me, Baron. Cover me on the dive. I'm in trouble. Lefebvre's plane bites the nose and at top speed rushes to the ground towards Dubrovka. I'm following him at close range, speed over 500 kilometers per hour. The altitude drops sharply. The variometer arrow deviates strongly, signaling too sharp a descent. What's wrong? Lefebvre must be having a serious malfunction. He wants to get back to base at any cost, which isn't far now. Lucky we were at 4,000 meters. The dive continues. I'm still covering the tail of Lefebvre's plane. Finally, the runway of our airfield begins to loom in the distance. I breathe a sigh of relief. Now Lefebvre will surely be able to land. But suddenly his plane begins to smoke. A milky trickle slides along the fuselage, turning behind the tail of the machine into a white band of fog, which every minute becomes more and more dense. Fear begins to overwhelm me. What is it? Is the engine too hot? Or a broken gas line? The latter would be far worse. And if that's the case, the fog is due to condensation from escaping gasoline. Lefebvre's voice still sounds calm in the headphones. Did Joffer, coming in for a landing? I'm covered in gasoline. I see him release the landing gear and the landing boards. Circling over the airfield, I continue to watch. He approaches the ground, lands, and begins to even taxi. I can clearly see him opening the cockpit lantern. He must be choking on gasoline fumes. And the second I want to scream, he's saved. Huge flames burst out of the cabin. Blazing like a torch, Lefebvre jumps to the ground. I see him rolling on the grass to dislodge the fiery tongues licking his clothes. Soldiers and mechanics rush to his aid. They clutch Lefebvre in their arms and cover him with their bodies so that the fire appears on the clothes of the rescuers. A hundred meters away from them, instead of the plane, is a bonfire, in which shells and ammunition are bursting. I land. Lefebvre is carried on a stretcher to the sanitary unit. His face, blackened with soot but not damaged. The pilot's clothes are burned, almost to the ground. His legs seem to be particularly badly damaged. He notices me. His eyelashes lower and rise again. He smiles. He doesn't look like a suffering man at all. Lebedinsky, our doctor, can't say anything definite. The size and extent of the burns must be ascertained. The doctor's eyes avoid our worried gazes. Besides, he continues, no less dangerous is kidney blockage. In three hours poor Lefebvre was taken to the Moscow Military Hospital in Sokolniki and a few days later, in front of Captain Delfino, who did not leave him until the last minute, Lefebvre died. Posthumously, he was awarded the title of Hero of the Soviet Union. Lefebvre was buried at the base of the monument to the French soldiers killed in the campaign of 1812, a huge granite pyramid surrounded by a barrier of gun barrels, fastened with chains. In Dubrovka, mourning is a terrible burden on everyone, but life goes on as usual. Lefebvre is replaced by Captain Mattress, who took command of the 3rd Squadron. I remain his partner. The combat missions continue. From dawn to 10 o'clock in the evening, we do not have a single free minute, and we are particularly annoyed that our exhausting work has so far yielded few results. On June 1, Bertrand alone hits a Junkers 88, which manages, however, to get away. This is not yet a victory. Finally, the first adventure with me. On June 5, 
about five o'clock in the afternoon, I flew out with Matras on a free hunt. We were circling over Vitebsk. Suddenly, when we were already returning to our airfield, anti-aircraft artillery comes into action. A lot of fireballs and arrows separate from the ground. Heading towards our planes, I can clearly see how several junkers rise into the air. Menacing clouds of bursting anti-aircraft shells begin to surround my car. They seem designed specifically for me. Besides, there's no sign of mattress. I fly at great speed, and suddenly a strong blow shakes my yak. The whole plane shook, shuddered, however, and I myself. In my head frantically whirled thoughts. I got caught. Apparently, not very seriously. The airplane obeyed the control. The speed hasn't decreased, and the temperature of the water in the radiator. It's rising. 130, 140 degrees. Smoke. It's starting to penetrate the cabin. The shell must have hit the radiator. Maybe I'll still be able to save the plane. I've got to hold on till the end. There's nothing to think about reaching Dubrovka. It's too far away. The smoke is getting thicker and thicker. The smell of burning is getting stronger. The ground is approaching. I see a river that wends among the plotted field. I ask myself a question. Where am I, over friendly land or over territory occupied by the Germans? But this question is of no use. The engine starts to break down, and the land is so close that it is impossible to delay. We have to land on the first field we find. Speed. Over 200 kilometers per hour, and at this speed my yak, without releasing the landing gear, touches the ground. A jump. Another jump. With all my strength I'm leaning on the seat. If only the straps would hold. If they break, I'll smash my face into the dashboard. They're holding. I'll keep my graceful profile. The plane is stopping. Finally, I wipe my sweaty forehead, and raising my head, I see a group of soldiers appearing at the edge of the forest. Russians. Germans. My heart is pounding hard. Hooray. It's the Russians. They're running with all their legs in a puff of steam from my airplane. A French pilot. Normandy Regiment, 303rd Smolensk Division. I mumble uncertainly, but that's enough. And the crowd, in which men and women are mixed, starts laughing and applauding. I am escorted to a tent city. This is a Red Cross Field Surgical Hospital, located a few kilometers from the front. I'm the center of everyone's attention. Everyone wants to talk to me. All languages have been tried, including deaf-mute. The results are far from brilliant. I've never been a polyglot, but today, apparently, completely stupefied and think worse than usual. The doctor major is forced to give up further attempts at conversation. He confines himself to the fact that characteristic gesture invites me to the table, where a rich dinner was waiting for me. In the evening I am taken to a tent where two female military doctors are staying. They try to strike up a conversation, but they have to give it up very quickly. I have no desire to talk, though. There are groans of the wounded and dying all around. My wrecked yak does not go out of my mind. The squadron must be racking their brains thinking about what happened to me, thinking about anti-aircraft guns, their murderous fire. Needless to say, I did not sleep a wink all night. Early in the morning a passenger car arrived at the hospital. Out of it came a slender colonel in impeccable uniform, on his head a cap with a green trim, which means belonging to the NKV troops. He came towards me and saluted in a military manner. I explained to him what had happened to me, where I had come from, and what unit I was serving in. At the words, Normandy Regiment, he smiled. I handed him my military ID card, which looked like a Soviet officer's ID card. He shook my hand firmly, even too firmly. Six hours of continuous jolting and Dabraka spread out before us. We left at dawn and arrived at the airfield exactly at noon. The first one I see is Mattress. He's waving his arms wide. Damn Baron, what's happened to you after all? That's what anti-aircraft artillery shots mean. Did you get your paid vacation? Traveling? You're lucky. You arrived on time.
Tonight we decided to do away with you. Cigarettes and everything else is ready for sharing. My captain. I apologize. I'm sorry, but it's probably not tonight that I'll lose my cigarettes. By the way, what time is the next flight out? At three o'clock, Baron. Free hunting near Vitebsk. But this time dodge the shells, laughingly tells me Mattress, the new commander of the 3rd Squadron. Captain Mattress is the type of a real commander who is respected and loved. He has a very energetic, swarthy face, to which a concerned frowning forehead and burning eyes under thick eyebrows give a stern expression. After graduating from flight school in 1937, he, driven by a thirst for a feat, moves to Russia. Leaving Paris in front of the Germans, passing through occupied France, Spain, North Africa, Egypt and Iran, Mattress finds himself in Moscow in less than three weeks. We made together with him more than 60 sorties and shot down a lot of Germans. So far, the front is relatively quiet. In the evenings we read, write letters or play cards. In the black starless sky from time to time fly single invisible airplanes, the rumble of which is long heard in the silence of the night. These are night bombers or planes on special missions. Russian pilots, or night sorceresses, as they are called by the Germans, fly out on missions every night and constantly remind us of themselves. Lieutenant Colonel Bershinskaya, a 30-year-old woman, commands a regiment of these lovely sorceresses who fly light bombers designed for night operations. In Sevastopol, Minsk, Warsaw, Gansk, everywhere they appeared, their bravery was admired by all male pilots. The French are known to love a joke, and the fair sex. When I want to tease Captain Mattress, I ask his permission to go to his superiors with a report on my appointment as a mechanic in the regiment of night witches. But one day after this joke, which has become almost classic, he calmly replies, Leave me alone, Marin. Tomorrow you won't care about the witches. The orders are to be on full alert, and I think it's going to be hot. Albert approaches Bertrand and Marcia, who, humming an uncomplicated tune, are tidying up. They feel in seventh heaven. Regimental commander Poyad assigned them to accompany the plane that flies to Moscow. If only they had something to dress up for, Albert Snidely says. Twenty-four hours in Moscow, of course, is not so bad, I agree. But you have to be able to use them. And in my opinion, with faces like yours, you can hardly achieve much. But now even Albert's taunts can't spoil Bertrand's good mood. Get away from me, Beeb. The old warrior feels at home everywhere. And then there's my Russian. Isn't that right, Marky? Of course, replies Marshy. They're just dying of envy. What are they talking about? Who can stop us from having a great time in Moscow? Go, Marshy. And in front of the entire regiment, Bertrand and Marshy fly to Moscow. It goes without saying that in Moscow, they did nothing reprehensible and slept very peacefully alone in the Savoy Hotel. It was evident from everything that serious events would not be long in coming. In a state of full combat readiness, sitting in shifts in airplanes, ready to leave in 15 seconds after the signal flare, we are waiting for our hour. To pass the time, we share memories of the past. Suddenly, at the moment you least expect it, a green rocket takes off into the sky. Immediately you turn on the ignition, the starter, and at a speed of over 400 kilometers per hour, we soar under the clouds, which guiled their loose bellies in the sunlight. We quickly climb into the sky above Dubrovka. In the headphones, a voice from the ground. Hello. Attention. Ryax. Height. 4,000 meters. Direction. Square 37B. A group of enemy airplanes has been spotted. Roger. You are understood. Comes the reply. The radio goes silent. Blind pursuit of some invisible enemy in some geographical point begins. After a while, there's another crackle in the headphones, and I can barely make out, Hello, Ryaki, follow to quadrant 38A, altitude, 5,000 meters. We are in pursuit of a ghost that eludes us. My neck aches from the exertion and my eyes pop out of my forehead. 
It seems to everyone that the enemy plane must be searched higher, always much higher than his own plane. The oxygen mask is on, the compressor is on, and we are climbing higher and higher. Aha! Finally! Here it is, Junkers 88, a scout. It is immediately distinguishable by a long white trail of condensed vapors, which comes off the fuselage and the ends of the wings. These three long white streaks may be the cause of his demise. Too late, the bomber is dive-bombing and heading west. Even at full speed, the interception fails. Today Junkers will deliver the information and photographs received. Tomorrow he may be less fortunate. June 15, near evening, from Division Headquarters reported that Colonel Golubov, commander of the 18th Guards Regiment, with whom we have been advancing for several months, in an air battle in the afternoon shot down two enemy aircraft, one Messerschmitt 109 and one Junkers 88. It also became known that the pilot from the hit Messer saved himself by jumping out with a parachute and is trying to reach his own. On the vast plain that stretches from Dubrovka to the front line, not easy to hide, and very soon the German disguised in civilian dress was discovered. On the ground it is damnably beginning to smell of an offensive. Rumor has it that 600 fighters, 400 attack planes and bombers have arrived at our neighboring airfields and are ready to spring into action at the first signal. There are columns of tanks, artillery and infantry moving back and forth on the roads. A million Russians against a million Germans, thousands of tanks and thousands of airplanes on both sides. There's bloody fighting ahead. We're always on the alert. But unlike other evenings tonight, as night fell, there was an unusual complete silence. No flares, no night sorcerers. Even the artillery has fallen silent. Sleep is not coming to me. I think of all these people who are now silently preparing for the assault. A new date is dawning. In the distance, a streak of sky pales on the horizon. I see familiar objects appearing more and more clearly, and suddenly, at exactly 6 a.m., a light show begins. All along the front line, from Vitebsk to Orsha, thousands of guns started talking. It is impossible to find words to describe the fiery curtain that rose from the ground to the sky, to give an idea of the wild rumble that engulfed the universe, suppressing instantly all other sounds. We cannot hear each other, and when we do want to say something, our voices seem thin and ridiculous. There is a feeling of depression and complete helplessness before this war, its immense power, which has turned nations into thousands of giant factories spewing out streams of molten iron and steel. But there is no more time to marvel at this world whose end science seems bent on bringing closer. Soviet aviation is coming into action. With a terrible roar, groups of 50 planes, passing bombers P-2, accompanied by fighters. In the clouds of smoke separating earth and sky, thousands of airplanes are spinning, sliding, as if in some magic ballet. Sauvage grabs my hand and shouts, Look, Baron, that one was hit. One P-2 bomber does break away from the already somewhat broken formation. The plane dives. Its tail is smoking, it's descending lower and lower. Well, what are they waiting for? Why don't they jump? We try to shout over the deafening roar of the engines. The pilot must be hurt, or maybe he wants to save the car at all costs. Someone screamed. One parachute has just opened, followed by another. But where's the third one? I can't see the third one. The bomber with a roar plummeted downward and crashed into the ground. A column of fire soared over the treetops. The Soviet pilot was killed. A little while later another airplane explodes in the air, then passed several attack aircraft with gaping holes in the fuselages. How do they stay in the air? Oh, they're real brave men, says Albert in a voice shaking with excitement. We are eager to be among them. We are feverish with impatience. We call out to Poyad and Delfino. What about us? We're not here for a feast, are we? Poyad shrugs his shoulders. Don't worry, there's enough fighting for all of us. And even more than enough. The German fighters haven't shown up yet. They're waiting for the meat grinder to end so they can attack. Then it will be our turn. 
The offensive continues, as if exhausted from the gigantic tension, silent artillery, but on the ground, turned into a blazing fire, entered the tanks. They have reached the main resistance point of the German positions. With the tracks and fire of their guns, the second echelon of tanks destroys the last fortifications, where the enemy is still resisting. Vitebsk is bypassed and taken in a ring. Orshid is taken. The Russians are still advancing. At eight o'clock in the evening, when dusk has not yet fallen to the ground, the regiment Normandy makes a combat sortie in full, split into two groups. One commanded by Pouillat, and the other, his deputy Major Delfino. In the first group of twenty-two, in the second seventeen fighters, both of them are given the task of blocking from the Air Borisov, to the outskirts of which approach the Red Army. German fighters hang in the air. The radio from the ground continuously warns. Attention, comrades. German airplanes, Fock Wolfs. But not only Fock Wolfs are in the air, the Messerschmitts have also arrived for a rendezvous. Captain Shaw and his wingman Kern shoot down the first two fighters, Messerschmitt 109. The situation heats up. The Germans take Lumaire and Gaston by surprise. Lumar's controls are damaged, with a huge hole in the fuselage. Gaston's plane is more seriously damaged. It flips in the air, leaving a trail of smoke behind it. We keep our eyes on it. One second, and it's over. Our hearts fill with anger and rage. Goodbye, Gaston. But the battle requires the full force of all our strength. Moynet and Taborit fiercely pursue the two Krats. Moynet turns a German fighter into a flaming torch in seconds. This is revenge for Gaston. Shawl and Mikkel are flying over Borisov in a dizzying round dance. Here, Shawl shoots down one enemy plane, then Michael shoots down another. But the Krat, before admitting himself defeated, trying to get out of a steep turn, fires a long burst and seriously damages Michael's machine, which lands with the retracted landing gear near Orsha. Yes, it was a real scuffle. One pity. Third Squadron didn't take part in that fight. That's what I think about at night, when the regimental commander reports the results of today's battle. Seventy-three sorties, seven downed enemy planes. Gaston died, but Mikkel was saved. Dear old Gaston, the war, in which he had been trying to participate for a long time, ended for him in the first battle. Further events unfolded so lightning fast and rapid that we do not have a moment to mourn the dead. The offensive is developing successfully. That is the most important thing. The Soviet troops have moved forward more than 200 kilometers and are rushing to the Neiman. Without giving the enemy a break, they pursue the scattered remnants of the Wehrmacht. They capture tens of thousands of prisoners, but even more are killed on the battlefield. The German front has collapsed. A large part of Soviet territory is liberated. Invaders haphazardly retreat to Lithuania and East Prussia. These battles are a great success of General Chernyakovsky, the youngest general of the Red Army. Unfortunately, he did not see the day of final victory. Chernyakovsky was later killed by an enemy shell near Königsberg during a tour of the battle area. We are still based in Dubrovka and therefore somewhat remote from the combat area. One day the Russians told us of an extraordinary incident that happened to Colonel Golubov, commander of the 18th Guards Air Regiment. During the pursuit of a messer on a striking flight, his plane caught fire, hit by anti-aircraft artillery fire. At that time, he was flying at a speed of 400 kilometers per hour. Goldubov reduced the speed to 200, descended, opened the cockpit lantern, and jumped without a parachute from the car engulfed in flames. He, of course, died. Involuntarily shouted we. No, he's alive. Excitedly tells us the regimental doctor, an eyewitness to this extraordinary case. Goldubov rolled on the ground for more than 20 meters, having lost consciousness from the terrible impact of the fall. Indeed, around noon, in front of the pilots of the 18th Regiment and Normandy frozen in formation, landed Douglas. In front of the hushed formation to the plane is carried on a stretcher Colonel Goldubov with a bandaged head. When the stretcher is near us, a huge effort of will, 
He forces himself to raise himself on his elbows. Deep creases furrow his dead pale face. His pelvic bones are damaged. Five ribs are broken, his skull is cracked, and his entire body is covered in abrasions. In a weak, barely audible voice, as if an alien from the other world, he utters words that I can never forget. Comrade pilots of the 18th Regiment, and you, our friends, the Frenchmen from Normandy, I'm sorry to have to leave you, but very soon I'll be back and I'll be with you until the final victory. Swear to me that you will do your duty sacredly. See you soon, friends. Glory to the Red Army. With one voice we shout. We swear. Six months later, the colonel returned to us. It was hard to watch as he waddled across the field, as if assembled from disparate parts. But as soon as he recovered a little, he immediately flew out on another combat mission at the head of the 18th Regiment, thus keeping his word. He commanded us until the final victory. This man was able to defeat even death. Again a lull comes for us. Our pastime these days resembles a period of vacation, although none of us wants to think of rest. Andra, a crayfish fisherman and a great builder, is trying to dam the river and make a swimming hole. The water in the river is noticeably reddish in color, but we pay no attention to it, until one day Andra bursts into our dugout with a loud shout. Don't you know what I've just found out? We don't say a word, of course. So, here it is. For two weeks we have been floating in the river and do not know that upstream of us on the bank there is a hospital where the seriously wounded are operated and treated. Now you understand where the reddish color and apothecary smell comes from. This discovery makes us shudder, but then we stop thinking about it. Soon we learn of Falton's disappearance. Together with his mechanic, he flew out in a Yak-7 to repair his fighter, which because of the accident he left 50 kilometers from Dubrovka. For two days we have been waiting for his return, but neither Falton nor the mechanic returned, and only a few months later, Russian soldiers found the remains of Falaton and the mechanic in the woods by the crashed Yak-7. Was he the victim of some malfunction or the prey of a German fighter? No one will ever be able to answer that question. On July 1, Pannon and Perrin repaid the death of their comrade with dignity. The Junkers 52 went 200 plus kilometers behind the front line on a strafing flight. Pannon and Perrin spotted it and simultaneously opened fire. They shot machine gun bursts first right, then left engine junkers, and he crashed into the pine forest at a speed of more than 300 kilometers per hour. Great job. At the end of July, we were announced to be relocated closer to the front. Well-informed people, Albert of course, among them, claim that we will operate near the borders of Poland, along the banks of the Niemen. There are also rumors that we will be sent to the Dokudovo area where are based three Soviet fighter aviation regiments, which, they say, got into a big mess. The airfield where the airplanes were based was attacked by a large group of Germans trying to get out of a deep encirclement. The pilots had to repel the attack with air machine gunfire. While awaiting relocation, regimental commander Poilabe takes advantage of our brief inactivity to clarify the details of the deaths of Gaston and Felton. To Pange and Pistrak in a potu, make an aerial reconnaissance all the way to Dokudovo. On their way back to the airfield, they notice the remains of a burned-out airplane on the field and decide to go for a landing. What happened to them next cannot now be recalled without laughter, but this story could have ended in a most unpleasant way. Examining the wreckage, they determined that some other plane had crashed here. Let's go back, Pistrak said to Pange, always laconic in conversation. Get in. Pistrak climbs into the cockpit and sits down. Depange, indifferent to everything around him, turns on the ignition. Suddenly, two Russian soldiers run out of the neighboring bushes. Threateningly waving pistols and automatic rifles, they run up to the airplane, climb on the wings, and shout, Who are you? Normandy, Depunge replies. In the hum of the running engine, the soldiers hear Germany. They grab Depange and Pistrak by the scruff of the neck, pull them to the ground and put the muzzles of their pistols to their temples. 
It's a miracle the soldiers don't shoot their victims. Our uniforms don't inspire confidence. Fortunately, Pistrak soon regains the power of speech, and only after an hour of tedious explanations, he and Depand were allowed to leave. On July 14, the order comes for us to relocate. Gray, overcast weather, low clouds, sticky, damp air. Things are packed instantly. The Douglases are leaving with most of the service personnel. We are to join them at the Lithuanian village of Mikuntani, halfway between Vilna and Lida. The first squadron with Poyet at the head takes off and disappears on the horizon at low altitude. Then the second squadron, under the command of Captain Morier, takes to the air. It is our turn. I start the engine, which is so lovingly cared for by my faithful Loin. Mechanics treat us with a sense of touching friendship. You should see their faces, their eager looks, their happy smiles when we tell them about our victories. They rejoice more than we do, but when one of ours did not return, we often had to watch them seclude themselves to cry their grief. All set. Squadron 3 is leaving now. But what is it? Suddenly, one of the second squadron's formation appears on a glide path. We try to make out the license plates on the planes. It's De Seines and Lebra's planes. Mattress makes a sign to me to take off the throttle. Lebra lands perfectly calmly, but De Seine circles helplessly over the airfield as if he can't see it. And then we notice a white streak of smoke curling along the fuselage. It's not hard to determine that it's a gasoline leak. Major Delfino runs to the microphone and repeats insistently, De Seine, jump. Desane, jump. Someone runs up to Delfino. My commander, Desane has his mechanic, Sergeant Belozov, in the tail section of the fuselage. Apparently, the desire to feast had taken hold of him as well. My captain, I answered with the look of a connoisseur. You will be given two liters of moonshine, a duck, two chickens, and two dozen eggs. Usually one shirt was exchanged for one liter of moonshine. The yard of the farm where we lived was like a motley fair, so much so that the variety of colors and bird cries were mixed here. Among us we found ourselves cooks of the highest class. Some were experts in cooking chickens, others stuffed ducks, others stews. Thanks to moonshine, the atmosphere at the feasts was relaxed and cheerful. Lots of jokes, anecdotes, songs. Sometimes in the mornings the mechanics of the first squadron organized a hunt in which Pierrot, Kazanev, Michael, Shal, and I took part. As soon as it became known that in the neighboring forests appeared a German gang, we immediately turned into a strike group. With automatic rifles in our hands, grenades on our belts, with our trusty TT on our side, we went deep into the forest thicket of green polish massifs. We set ambushes, camouflaged in bushes, usually near the intersection of forest paths and roads. With our finger on the trigger, we waited for darkness to fall, knowing that the Germans could only appear at night. Time passed in ominous anticipation. For many languid hours we could hear only the light noise of wind in the tops of trees, the creaking of pines, the cry of a lone fox, the howling of a wolf. Suddenly, just when everyone was beginning to peck their noses, some extraneous sound broke the silence. It was a barely discernible rustle, unlike the other rustles of the night. It was a faint sound that fell out of the majestic symphony of the night forest. Cautious footsteps, whispers, rattling of weapons, muffled cursing. Here the wavering shadows of armed men loom against the dark green background. Forcing them to surrender is no easy task. We fire at random. On command, all of our ten automatic rifles crackle, screams, bodies falling, a few single shots back. Then there is silence and waiting for dawn. Sometimes corpses were found, sometimes there were none. But always the wide streaks of blood on the moss showed that our bullets had reached their target. Once in a while we went on an excursion to Vilna, and then the impression that we were approaching France was even stronger. There are no more huts no more domes. In front of us are houses built in the Gothic style, hotels of international class, reminiscent of the Palace Hotel in any capital city. 
In some neighborhoods, the war left no traces, although there were fierce battles in Vilna, and 8,000 German graves were added to the city cemetery. Then we were busy visiting Polish villages, where we tried to perfect our science of exchange and make small acquaintances, which were forgotten the next day. One day toward evening, returning with Irabarn after our usual walk, we see that there is a battle going on at the farm. Automatic anti-aircraft guns have been turned into field guns and are hitting with direct fire. There is a strong smell of cinders. They must be krauts, remnants of the Wehrmacht, says Irabarn. Hunger forced them out of the woods after all. They must have. But what do we do? How do we get back to our place? They might shoot us like partridges. We decide not to give any sign of life, lest we really lose it, and spend the night crawling into the forest thicket, waiting for the end of the turmoil. Good idea. In the morning, we learn that a group of Germans attacked the farm with utter contempt for death, and the Russian soldiers met them with fire. Having previously received orders to shoot without warning as soon as anything seemed suspicious to them. At last the days of idleness and idleness come to an end. The sorties are resumed. The battle for the Neman has begun. Flights to block Kaunas, the capital of Lithuania. From the air, follow one after another. Major Delfino warns us that the enemy anti-aircraft artillery has been particularly active lately. On July 28, about seven o'clock in the morning, one wing of the 4th Squadron flies out with the task of patrolling in the area that seems so calm and safe. Suddenly, the voice of Captain Shell breaks into the airwaves. Attention, anti-aircraft guns. Attention, anti-aircraft guns. The Germans open a rare measured fire on our planes. It seems that in this sector air defense batteries are served by real snipers. A few minutes later, Genesis plane is badly damaged. Decheris' machine bursts into flames, and he parachutes out. An hour later, Depange finds him. We leave Mikantani and fly to Alitis, a town about 50 kilometers south of Kaunas, on the left bank of the Neman River. Surrounded by coquettish villas, it seems extinct. The town's state-of-the-art bridge has been blown up, and its trusses rest in the waters of the river running lazily to the Baltic Sea. Corpses are everywhere on sidewalks, in houses, on the riverbank, in the river. In the personal notebook of De Penvern, a guy from the 3rd Squadron, there is the following entry. Alitis, July 30, 1944, on the bank of the Neiman. Swam in the river, surrounded by the corpses of German officers floating downstream. And this is the real truth. Our new airfield is located on the territory of the former Lithuanian airbase, whose service and living quarters were completely destroyed during the German attack on Moscow. The soldiers' barracks serves as our canteen, and we ourselves are comfortably accommodated in small cottages on the right bank of the Neiman River. Barely settled, we rush into the deserted town spreading out on the opposite bank. I shout to Savage. If you want to join us, you'll have to swim across the Neiman. But Savage was more cunning. As soon as I was in the water, Stripped naked, he was already driving a boat, wielding an oar. The city of Alitis is horribly destroyed. The doors of the houses have been knocked off their hinges with rifle butts. Everything is smashed, littered, destroyed. It's no exaggeration to say that literally every meter was fought for. I had the honor to participate in the first air battles on July 30. Under the command of Mattress, we patrol in four pairs. The weather is fine. Only rare clouds can hide us from the enemy. Flying over Suwaki, which was still in the hands of the Germans, Schall and Bysade saw four enemy planes and engaged them in combat. At full speed, Mattress and I follow our comrades and get into the fray. In front of us are four Focke-Wolf fighters escorting Junkers 87 and Junkers 88 bombers. Luftwaffe pilots, Mustachians, as we call them, fight like lions. Andrew is the first to win, and we see the pilot of the downed airplane jumping with a parachute. Our radios don't stop for a minute. Attention, Penn. Look out, Lee Martelot. Monier, turn around. There's a roar and squeal in the headphones. 
We're spinning like crazy. I make a steep turn and in the crosshairs of the sight manage to notice the black swastika of the German plane. I sharply press the trigger and don't even try to see the results. The smell of gunpowder intoxicates me. My airplane spins, dives like a madman, soars like a candle, does flits. My teeth are clenched, my temples are pounding. The other pairs are out of sight and I'm alone in the sky above Suwaki. I'm out of ammunition. In the distance, the shining Neiman is a marvelous landmark. Ten seconds of strafing, and I'm at the airfield. I'm burning up like a fever. I'm looking forward to hearing about the attack. Monier and Baysaid are missing. Andrew got off all right, but his yak is riddled with bullets. Shrapnel from an anti-aircraft shell tore off an aileron and part of the wing. But he still shot down one fuck wolf. Le Martelot shot down another, and Shawl, bombard Junkers 87. At half past five, it was 4th Squadron's turn to grapple with Messerschmitt 109s, which were fiercely attacking a group of attack aircraft. Congratulations to Perrin who, by destroying one of the Messers, saved an attack pilot whose life hung in the balance. Before sunset, the 1st Squadron takes off. It persistently, but unsuccessfully pursues 18 Fock Wolfov. On their return, Albert and De La Poix do not hide their irritation. In addition, Baysaid and Monier never returned. Therefore, in spite of the legalized 100 grams of vodka, there is a sullen silence in the dining room that evening. We began early, however, to mourn the disappeared Baysaid and Monier. The very next day after the battle it became known to us that Monve, having jumped with a parachute, descended 50 meters from the Russian trenches, where he was picked up by Russian soldiers under the very nose of the Germans. However, Baysed only showed up after the war, having returned from captivity. On the same day the regiment commander Puyad returned from Moscow. He brought with him letters and a lot of news. Gentlemen, he announced to the pilots, in June, the number of our officially recognized victories reached 88, and we are now in second place among the French fighter units operating on all fronts. In addition, Stalin signed an order to award the regiment Normandy the name Neiman for participation in the battles to force the Neiman River. From now on our regiment will be called the Normandy Neiman Regiment. Order of the Military Cross. Bright delivers them to Moscow. On the same day they are replaced by Major Vdovin, together with whom we fight until the victory. At the front again all is quiet. Our actions are mainly limited to the cover of P-2 airplanes, which make an aerial survey of the front line. August 8 came, my birthday. I was preoccupied from the morning. I wanted to get a few liters of moonshine and vodka to celebrate with friends from the 3rd Squadron my 24 years worthily. The Lord God did not forsake me. On that day, a plane arrived with mail, cigarettes, new ranks. True, there was no order for me. I was still a graduate student. But promotions in the ranks of others, as if by magic, made carefully hidden bottles appear in the light, and my anniversary merged with a joyful event in the lives of those who rose higher up the ladder. All night long, there was a terrible clamor. Soon rumors reached us, as if the Germans concentrated on our section of the front more than 700 fighters and bombers and are preparing a serious massive blow. However, we were even more stunned by the interpreter Eichenbaum's message that we should receive a new fighter plane, Yak-3. And while we are waiting for it, Albert summarizes the combat activity of the regiment on the Eastern Front for the period of the second campaign, that is, for the last three months. 1,015 combat sorties, 12 unconditional victories, 3 probable. Six of our pilots died. On the miraculous morning of August 13, the regiment, still based at the airfield in Alitis, snatched the famous Yak-3 fighters. Soviet ferry pilots, who flew them from Saratov, lined up the machines near the control center. All personnel of the regiment rushed to them. Everyone was seized with extraordinary excitement. I was one of the first to run up and start stroking the airplane, to which from now on my life will be entrusted. Glorious Lockin stands next to me. With such machines, he exclaims, 
the war will soon be over. Distribution of new equipment between the four squadrons is not without disputes and mutual reproaches. Everyone, having chosen a certain airplane, which for unknown reasons seems to him better than all the others, fiercely defends what he considers as his property. The Yak-3 fighter is a very light in weight airplane, which certainly has much in common with the Yak-9 fighter, but differs from it in its higher flying qualities, more perfect form and thoroughness of finishing. Russian engineers, working under the direction of designer General Yakovlev, changed the outline of the fuselage, markedly improved the engine and improved the equipment of the cockpit. The visibility is marvelous, especially forward. The aircraft has excellent maneuverability. When performing, a candle gives the impression that the machine will never stop. At dive, the airplane develops great speeds. Do not have time to give the handle, as the arrow already shows a speed of over 600 kilometers per hour. This is certainly a virtue, which, however, you need to know how to use. Armament is the same. 20 millimeter gun in the propeller hub and two synchronous large caliber machine guns. The only drawback is that on the first machines were not particularly reliable chassis, but this is not able to reduce our enthusiasm. We with eyes burning with admiration fidget around the new machines. Well, how is it? Do you like it? You ask. Now get us Fock Wolfs and Messerschmitts. The sound of a gong invites us to gather. We have a tour to con us. We ride in a comfortable German bus, taken among other war trophies at Stalingrad. The highway stretches along the Neiman River through picturesque villages, almost unaffected by the war. Wrecked German tanks lying in roadside ditches mark the path of victory like milestones. Connus is spread on both banks of the Neiman River, but most of the city is on the right bank. Soviet sappers are building a wooden bridge to replace the stone bridge blown up by the Germans during the retreat. Before the war, Connus had 150,000 inhabitants, mostly Lithuanians and Jews. The latter occupied a special quarter on the outskirts of the city, separated by a small hill. They lived in wooden and brick houses built for them by the Russians in 1940 after their entry into Poland and Lithuania. The Germans turned the Jewish quarter into a concentration camp. They surrounded it with barbed wire, beyond which one could only go out through a guard post guarded by sentries. Every day at dawn the men were rounded up and inspected. Then they were sent to build fortifications, and if in the evening anyone was found to have escaped, his family, even children, were immediately shot. The Jews were starving to death, and the Lithuanians tried in every possible way to give them something to eat. The torment of the Jews lasted for three years and tragically ended on July 14, a few days before the Soviet troops arrived. On that day, the Germans brutally murdered all the Jews. The SS troops forced the owners to booby-trap their own houses, in which the families were locked up. Then the SS ordered the unfortunates to blow up their homes themselves. The terrible explosion shook the city. The people who miraculously survived the explosion, maddened by terror, were mercilessly shot by the SS, every last person. When we found ourselves on the site of the Connus Ghetto, we saw thousands of disfigured corpses scattered among the debris of dwellings. Shocked, we photographed this horrific scene. When we returned to the city, I was the only one who had the strength to speak. I am deeply convinced that I have clearly expressed the thoughts of each of my comrades in the following words. Despicable scoundrels. They deserve to be treated the same way. But they know that no one is capable of such atrocities. Too bad we can never make them fully accountable for the misery they have caused people. Not surprisingly, after this terrible vision, we did not have much fun exploring Connus. We walked slowly down the main street of the city, a wide tree-lined alley where once old people used to take their afternoon walks peacefully, glimpsed the opera house and the buildings of official institutions. Our attention was not drawn to the Orthodox Church, which stands majestically at the end of Stalin Boulevard and is a mixture of Byzantine style and Rococo. The stores were empty, the cafes deserted. We had the impression that we had entered an extinct city. However, we were soon surrounded by a crowd of Connus residents. 
Extremely polite, attentive, and helpful people. Are you French? Shouts one of the crowd. Of course I am. A Parisian. Yes. That's great. I used to live there. And now, amazed, I hear the true argot of the Parisian markets. We are surrounded by beautiful, elegant women, neatly and tastefully dressed. Using Esperanto, which consists of a mixture of Russian, Lithuanian, and English, we start conversations, which have, of course, quite a definite purpose. I am invited by the wife of a doctor who owns a charming house on the embankment, but I have hardly had time to try out the comfort of the chairs before I have to leave, and Captain Mattress, seeing my annoyed face, rolls with laughter. Don't be upset, did Joffrey. You'll have more than one opportunity to come back here. In the evening in the dining room, the regimental commander addresses us with a little friendly speech. Gentlemen, rest is over. Let's get to work. The command requires us to use every sortie to destroy as many Boches as possible, wherever they are, in a car, on horseback, in an airplane, in formation or alone, we must attack and destroy them everywhere. They must be pursued relentlessly, without giving them the slightest respite. In accordance with this order, our first such sorties began. Trucks, trains at the stations, horse carts, soldiers in the fields, everything fell into the sight. The accuracy of fire of the new Yak-3 fighter was exceptional. A real artistic work, however, not always safe. In these peculiar combat actions, Shal and Michael flying in a pair are especially distinguished. They are first-class aerial snipers who carefully polish each maneuver. Sometimes for better aiming, they descend so low that literally press to the ground and often on the hub of the propeller or on the tail feathers delivered to the airfield telegraph wire scraps. My captain, Shul once reported, I was forced to descend a little lower than usual to fire on a group of crowds who were repairing the telephone line. If even they are not all killed, at least I added to their work, taking with them all the wires. On August 25, Dor, who spends all his spare time at the receiver at the regimental radio station, bursts into our room. The London BBC has just reported that General Leclerc's troops have liberated the French capital in conjunction with the revolting population of Paris. Paris has been liberated. The news spreads instantly through the camp. The Russians embrace us. Engineer Captain Agavillan arranges a salute, and from nine o'clock in the morning everything that can shoot, shoots. The most optimistic are convinced of the near end of the war. Defeated in the east and defeated in the west, the Krauts can no longer delay surrender. Golko Albert doesn't share the general jubilation. Do not deceive yourself. He cools the most heated heads. Krat so easily will not give up. Do not rejoice before the time. You'll see, they will make us still suffer. But no one wants to listen to the ominous predictions of Albert, who, however, turned out to be so cruelly right. Two days later, a grand banquet is organized. Poilade and Zakharov are literally carried on their hands. Everyone is preparing for their return. Each sees himself as already returned to his homeland. But the next day our joy is overshadowed by the death of Bertrand, one of the few who had passed over forty, and who was called a veteran of the Dijon Link, an old warrior, flying with him marshy immediately after landing, with a dead pale face on which cold sweat streamed, deafening voice reported the drama. My commander, about twelve o'clock we were west of Gumbinnen, at an altitude of about 400 meters. Everything was normal. Suddenly I saw Bertrand start to dive at a target I never could see. All he said to me over the radio was, let's go, Marshy, let's go. I follow him. I give up the handle. The speed is increasing rapidly, 500, 650, then 700 and even higher. I say to myself, Bertrand is overdoing it but I keep up. The earth is approaching with tremendous speed. In the sunlight I see an object separating from the plane, probably a piece of the right wing. Bertrand's car immediately goes into a corkscrew. At over 750 kilometers, it's hurtling toward the ground. It's a wild ride. I'm flying like a fog. 
I can see black circles in front of my eyes from the exertion. The cockpit lantern is blown off. But here the handle becomes more pliable. My yak comes out of the dive. I'm saved. A fraction of a second more, and I'd have followed Bertrand to the end. Old Bertrand. He will never return to his native Burgundy to drink a goblet of red wine for meeting his countrymen, as he said on the Moscow radio. We are warned not to develop too much speed on the dive. And now every time Metris and I go into a dive to fire on the Germans on the ground, my eyes are constantly watching the arrows of the instruments. On September 1, we provide air support to Russian infantry and tanks who are conducting a combat reconnaissance to probe the German defenses south of the Neiman. This allows us to see with our own eyes the exceptionally clear interaction between Soviet infantry and aviation. Termoviks, P-2s, Le-7s, Yak-3s are continuously bombing and shelling the fortified German positions. Particularly terrible destruction is made by attack aircraft. These are real winged tanks. War, love and cuisine continue to be the three driving stimuli of our lives. Cafu and de saint Fel take a plane 100 kilometers away from our base to buy some chickens. We organize pantagruel feasts, ending usually with a crazy poker game. After a stormy night we fly out to hunt. During one of these sorties veteran of the 1st Squadron de Chain, an inveterate smoker, and the owner of a throat capable of passing any liquid, as long as it was strong enough, takes by surprise a German tanker with gasoline, at the stern of which was flying a huge flag with a swastika. The ship's crew, unable to make out the distinctive insignia, welcomed his plane by waving their arms in a friendly manner. Even when alone in the cockpit, Deschenet can't resist quipping aloud. I'm going to make you guys move differently now. He makes a turn almost over the water, and now the plane is over the ship. Machine guns and cannons spit out fiery lines. After the second approach, the whole bridge is covered with blood. After the third approach, the ship, on which here and there appear flames, loses control and, spinning on the whirlpools, slides downstream. Soon it hits the piles of the bridge and explodes. This was the last episode before the flight to Antonovo, a new stage on the way to France. Or, to be more precise, let's not be too eloquent on the way to Prussia.